Uh, so joining me now is Sir Patrick Vallance, the Chief Scientific Advisor. Um, Patrick, thanks so much for joining us. Appalling news of deaths today. But for a few days, it looks as though the infections data is coming down a bit. W would you agree? Well, I mean, first of all, it's absolutely appalling uh, numbers uh, again. Um, and, you know, I, I do want to start off by just saying a big thank you to everybody in the NHS who's working under unbelievable pressure, really under difficult circumstances and doing a brilliant job. And to say the best thing we can all do is to stay at home to help them. Because the more we stay at home and reduce contacts, the better this is going to become. And you're right that um, there are some signs that the infection rate may be levelling off or even coming down in some places as a result of the fact that people have been really good at sticking to the stay at home message. So the more we can do that, the more we'll see hopefully this coming down further. Um, but there'll be a lag, of course, before that translates into changes in hospitalisation and death. I mean, we've seen this shocking death number today. Uh, have we just got to brace ourselves for several days of deaths at this kind of l level? Well, the, the daily numbers jump around a bit, but um, I think we are in a position now, when you look at the number of infections we've had over the past few weeks and how this is likely to continue, so I don't think they're going to drop very quickly, that I'm afraid we're in for a period of high death numbers that's going to carry on for some weeks. It's not going to come down quickly, even if the uh, uh, measures that are in place now start to reduce the infection numbers. So we're in for a pretty grim period, I'm afraid. I mean, infections, as you say, levelling off and in some areas coming down, that would suggest to many people that the existing restrictions are the right ones. Do you, do you agree? Well, I think the existing restrictions, and, and again, you know, I pay tribute to everybody for actually doing what, what people are doing to stick to them, because it's never easy, but they are making a difference, and you can see that. So I think what we know now, which we didn't know a few weeks ago, was would these sorts of restrictions be enough to bring this uh, virus under control with the new variant? And the answer is, yes, it looks like it is, and things are at least flattening off in some places, not everywhere, some places are still going up, but it does look as though those places that have been in the tier four level restrictions for longest and now the lockdown with school closures, uh, they're leveling off or coming down. So the answer is yes, um, it, it, it'll hold it, but at very high numbers and we need to be pushing this down. And so just on that issue of pushing it down, what people really wanna know, I think, well, there's lots that people want to know, but one of the things they want to know is, are there going to be even more severe restrictions? Well, I think, I think this is a pretty comprehensive package of, uh, and, if, and if the stay at home message, which is the really key one, of making sure you minimise the number of contacts, we all do it, people are doing it well, we need to keep minimising contact. And I just want to give you an example. So, if you have a contact, let's say you, you, you meet somebody for, for an hour because you're at work or something else, then you meet somebody else for an hour in a situation because you um, meet them in the supermarket or whatever, and you meet somebody else for an hour because um, you've gone for a walk with them. Each of those people has their own networks as well. And so you start connecting up networks. So what you find before very long is that you've actually had contact with potentially 50 or 60 or 70 people because of a network connection. Mm. And if you think that maybe one in 50 people across the country have now got the infection, in some cases it could be as high as one in 20 or one in 15, you begin to see how this can spread. So the, the sort of simple message is stay at home, absolutely minimize contacts. If that's done, that's the best way to uh, get this under control. And I think it's the indoor um, uh, connections which are really, really important and the ones we need to keep focusing on. Because there are lots of people who say, don't take away my right, for example, to see one person outside. And it sounds as though you think that perhaps the mental health benefits of that certainly outweigh the risks. You're saying it's the indoor infections that are the ones we have to worry about. Indoor infections are really the ones to worry about. I think exercise is important for people. People do need to get out. But I think it's really important with that that the rule is exercise with one other person. It's mm. not exercise with sure. three other people, ten other people. And, and, you know, once you start getting into crowding and you start getting people together, then, of course, you do increase the network connections. You do increase the probability that somebody who's with you could be infected. And the difficulty is because a lot of people are asymptomatic, 
don't have show any signs or symptoms with this disease, uh, that you can be with somebody without knowing that they're infected. So I think indoor definitely is the place to concentrate on, uh, and outdoor, it's, you know, again, it's the matter of, of really being um, consistent with the rules and making sure that, that, that we all do what we're doing. And I think, again, you know, people are really doing a pretty good job. So I, 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 I want to move off this because we've got so much more, but just very briefly, it does sound to me as though you're saying, so long as we, the people, as it were, follow the existing restrictions, you don't think we need more restrictions? I think if we follow these, the evidence we have now far, so far is this is beginning to work, holding it flat, beginning to potentially push it down. We need to monitor it. And, you know, it may be that we need more on top of this at some point. I'm absolutely not ruling that out. I mean, it may be that we need more on top of this. And, and I think those are uh, 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 decisions, obviously, that ministers would need to make. But I think at the moment, the evidence is that this is having, having an effect. Now, we've seen today uh, this Brazilian mutation uh, being discussed. How much do we know about it? Well, we know that the Brazilian mutation has some of the features of some of the others. So, so what, 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 what we're seeing is that mutations are cropping up across the world, which are quite similar in terms of the changes. So um, the Brazilian one, like the South African one, has a change uh, um, uh, of the genetic code at uh, position 484. And that changes a um, part of the protein, it changes a bit of a shape of the protein, uh, and that's that's something that, 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 that one looks at and says, well, what effect could that have? Um, you know, so it's similar to the South African variant in that respect. Could it be more um, severe? Um, well, there's no evidence at all with any of these variants that it makes the disease itself more severe. So the changes that we're seeing with the variants are largely around increased transmission. It makes it easier to get it from one person to another, mm. makes it easier, therefore, to catch. Um, no evidence yet for the UK version that it makes a difference in terms of how the immune system recognises it. And if you've been exposed to the old variant or you've had a vaccine, it looks like that's going to work just as well uh, with this new variant for the UK one. Um, South African one and Brazilian one, we don't know for sure. There's a bit more of a risk that this might make a change to the way the immune system recognises it, but we don't know. Those experiments are, are underway. I think most people think that if there's a change to the way vaccines work, it's not going to be a sort of all or nothing. It may be that in some cases this diminishes it a little bit, but there's no evidence for that uh, yet. But can, but can I ask you on that, though? If, you know, because you, you've got a plan for these eventualities, if a yeah. mutation turned up that we were pretty sure the existing vaccines don't work on. What's your plan for that moment? Well, I think, I think that ultimately, I do expect that there'll be mutations in time over years and so on that lead to changes in the virus. That's what happens with other viruses. It's what happens, for example, with flu and why you have a different flu vaccine every year. And so it's completely conceivable that we're going to need a modified vaccine, um, you know, every year, every other year or something, we don't know exactly when, but that's, com that's completely possible. And one of the beauties of the modern vaccine technology, um, so I'll take the messenger RNA example, uh, vaccines as an example, is it's actually relatively easy to make that change. And so provided uh, the regulatory authorities see that as a minor change, don't see it as something that needs to go through the whole process again, that becomes a way of making a rapid change. So that may be where, where this ends up, we don't know but we've got the technologies, which means it's relatively easy to do. Because can I just ask you, if we were unlucky and the mutation turned up that was just too different from the existing strains, could you rapidly swing into action and get our current stock of vaccines changed? I'm just trying to sort of, in a sense, eliminate some of the fears that people put to us. Well, you wouldn't be changing the current stock of vaccine. The current stock of vaccine is the current stock of yeah. vaccine. What you can do, though, is quite easily, particularly with messenger RNA vaccines, but with others as well, go back and change the vaccine at the start. And then provided the regulators see that as a modification of an existing vaccine, you can quickly do clinical studies just to detect it's all working in the immunology without having to do big clinical trials and you can go straight into the clinic. But that, that's for the future, it's not, it's not for now. I think, I think people are pretty optimistic that this is an easy um, set of vaccines that you could change the design of them uh, relatively quickly. And as I say, it's not a new problem, it's the problem that we have with 
flu year on year that you get changes that you need to make a new vaccine to accommodate. Now, we've had lots of questions from viewers and Anushka is going to put them to you. Yeah, hi, Patrick. So we've had Ask Valance, the hashtag running today. And let me just start with one from Neville Kent. He asked, the Pfizer vaccine can't be injected into under 16s and the Oxford one into under 18s. Are there plans to look again at this and reduce the age limit? Well, at the moment, the, the focus on vaccination and the, and the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation has been pretty clear about what the priorities are. They've said, go for those people who are at most risk of uh, getting seriously ill or dying from the disease. And so that's why they've got their categorization. And the top lot are um, people in uh, care homes over the age of 80, everyone over the age of 80, uh, people who work in healthcare and, and care homes, and so on. And so you can see the top four categories. And what we know is that those top four categories actually make up the vast majority of people who unfortunately are at risk of dying from this disease. Um, so they're the ones to concentrate on, get those done as soon as we can to try and protect them. And only when you go much later do you start thinking about younger age groups and others. And just to sort of put that into context, but it's estimated that for every person who's vaccinated in a care home, every 20 people who are vaccinated in a care home, one death would be protect, uh, um, prevented. When you get down to people under the age of 50, every 50,000 people okay. you vaccinate um, would present one death. So, so do you have a sense then of when the vaccine overall becomes effective? Is there a point in time yeah. which you think is a moment which will be a huge shift? Well, I think, I think as all of that age group and the at-risk people I've talked about get vaccinated, okay. you would expect over the next few weeks to start seeing an effect on death as the first indicator, okay. uh, hospitalizations later. A different idea here from Jerry, who asks, whatever happened to the sniffer dogs that were having nearly 100% success? <laughs> she says they're already being used in care homes in France and she can't think of a more cost-effective and unintrusive way of checking airport arrivals. Have you ever considered them? Uh, I, th I think I think sniffer dogs to pick things up have been uh, tried for all sorts of medical conditions, and they tend to sort of get a bit of a, 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 a interest for a while, and then then drop off because it's not a very uh, um, effective way of doing it usually. Okay, um, why are you not recommending vitamin D, C, and zinc to everyone to improve their immune systems? This from Essex Lady. Well, I think um, uh, the evidence that vitamin D works for COVID is certainly very variable at best, but there are recommendations out from Public Health England about taking vitamin D over the winter, and they've given pretty clear recommendations that vitamin D is useful for other reasons uh, to take over the winter, okay. and, and people do. Okay, and if you can answer this in 10 seconds, do we know if it can be caught twice yet? Yeah, you can. Um, it's rare. I mean, but 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 most people who call it once get protected and don't don't uh, aren't at risk for catching it again over a short period. And actually, it looks like it's pretty protective. The evidence is that this really does stop you catching it a second time for for at least many months. And obviously, we don't know longer than that yet. Lovely. Thank you very much for answering those. Back to Robert. So, got a couple of final quick ones. You said the mutation hasn't sort of changed its impact that much other than the way that it's being transmitted. But lots of doctors say to me they are seeing younger sufferers in hospital. Is, is that a real thing, that younger people are having to be hospitalised? It doesn't actually look like it. So, 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 I mean, there are more young people being hospitalised because there are more people with the infection. So it's true that lots of young people are ending up in hospital and, and about a quarter of the people, I think, in hospital are now under the age of 55. So, I mean, a, a reminder of how this can affect everybody. But if you look at the distribution overall, it still looks roughly the same with this variant and the old one. Now, uh, there's a lot of talk uh, about the stress on people who've been at the front line of this uh, for nine months. Actually, the whole country is finding this stressful. You have, it, it would seem to me, one of the most stressful jobs around because your uh, advice determines, you know, how ill people get, whether people live or die. What are your own coping strategies? Well, I, I, I mean, I, I try and stick as absolutely firmly as possible to the, to, to, to the science on this. And uh, my coping strategies involve en enormous help and support with my colleague, Chris Whissey. So that's been incredibly important. <laughs> I take exercise regularly and uh, I make sure that, um, uh, that I don't... But what do you do deviate. to relax? What do you do to relax? What do I do to relax? Well, I, I'm afraid I'm a bit of a box set addict. And uh, I sit with my wife and watch uh, watch Scandi and, and French box sets and things like that. So, so, uh, so recommend 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 one to our viewers. Oh well, I, I really enjoy Spiral. 
French well, one. Oh, I love Spark. Really? Yeah, me too. Great choice. <laughs> Lovely to see you, Patrick. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.